This morning I wanted to share with you about treasure hunt. You know, the, the ongoing challenge and excitement of figuring out all the clues, trying to recognize whatever distinguishing features there are, and then finally coming to the moment, this is it. Treasure. You, you, you don't know how it's going to go. Just like this past week, a, a guy about an hour or so out of Melbourne, Australia, found a rock. He didn't know it was worth $160,000 because it was 10 pounds of gold. That, you know, then there's those places that have a mysterious history, like Oak Island, where there's all kinds of legends about pirate treasure there and and maybe much more at the bottom of this thing they call the money pit that's a shack that goes down over 100 feet and been there for hundreds and hundreds of years and lots and lots of people have tried to discover what's down there. It's, I think they've got a show for it on the History Channel. And then there's those documented losses of huge treasure. Like in 1708 when British warships sank Spain's San Jose, a 64-gun ship that had gold and silver and emeralds and jewels to the amount of over $17 billion today. In 2015, the, the Colombian Navy made a confirmed discovery. And, um, they, they declared it as Colombia's. But Spain is taking a legal challenge to that as it belonging to them. So, so we find out that in this treasure hunt thing that even finding and then possessing are two different things. Well, I, I want us to consider for a moment that the Old Testament book of Proverbs tells us, informs us to go on a treasure hunt. It really does. Proverbs chapter 2. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Proverbs goes on and, and makes it very plain that this wisdom is more than any treasure of gold or silver, that it's more valuable to us than those things. Chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days is in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. I don't know, but I, I would assume that I'm not the only one that reads those kind of verses and the gears kind of spin a little bit and I wonder, well, what is this wisdom? What is this that's going to benefit my life like that? Well, I, I want to share with you, I know some of you have seen this before. It's from a series called The Bible Project and it's it's have something to say about Proverbs. I'll let you listen to a minute or two of it. So it's about our attitude towards God and His definitions of right and wrong and His definitions of us and the necessity to humble ourselves and not limit the things that we learn from Him to just knowledge but make it a part of life application. So we see that 
That's what wisdom is, according to Proverbs. Well, the Apostle Paul made an interesting statement to believers in Corinth about the wisdom of God. And so I want us to take note of that. It's in 1 Corinthians 1, and verses 24 and 25, Paul says, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. And I should have probably used the verse before it, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks' foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. And then if we look at what he concludes with in verse 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So Paul gives us this understanding that the fullness of wisdom is in Christ. It's in Christ. And if we connect the dots with Proverbs, then all of a sudden we find out that Christ is the treasure. Christ is the treasure that's going to give you all those things that Proverbs extols about the benefits in your life. And if we just take that thought for a minute and maybe start to connect it with things that Jesus taught in the Gospels, let's look at what he had to say in Matthew 11, 25 through 29. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see that we're to learn from Jesus. We're to learn from Him. And that teachableness that wisdom requires, that was spoke of in Proverbs, that fear of the Lord, that it takes that if you want to receive the wisdom, we're to learn from Jesus. We're to have this same teachableness, a willingness to receive from Him. And just like Old Testament wisdom, it's not enough to just know it. You have to live it. Isn't that what Jesus taught in Matthew 7, verse 24, when He says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So Jesus is saying the same thing. That you have to apply the wisdom he gives us. So I want us to consider this morning things Jesus taught. Now, that could be overwhelming. We know that Jesus taught so much, this could take us probably every direction of the, of the compass. But the Gospels share with us that Jesus came teaching the kingdom of God. And if you begin to look through the Gospels, you're going to find that Jesus referred to the gospel, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, over a hundred times. Over a hundred times. He came teaching about the kingdom. Now, have you ever stopped to think about what happens when a new kingdom comes? When there's a change in kingdoms? How much change there really is? There's a whole new value system, usually. There's new laws. There's probably going to be new money. And there's new cultural standards about what's accepted in this new kingdom. Now, when you stop and think about that kind of change, and you stop and think about what Jesus came teaching, 
He came teaching the values and the standards of the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus came teaching. And I know there's much, much more to, to look at than what we're going to this morning, but I want us to look at three. The first one's faith. It's a pretty big essential, isn't it? Because without faith, you can't be born again. Without faith, you can't see or enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember that conversation in John 3 that Jesus had with Nicodemus about all of these things, Nicodemus being the teacher of the Jews? And a big part of that faith is to be in and about who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Remember John 3.16? We have to believe that God, that Jesus is God's only begotten Son. We have to believe that He was the one given to make atonement for our sin, that we could have salvation. That's all faith. That's all faith. And I, I want us to understand that a little bit of the truth about faith. You know, all the Gospels record Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And that's normally what this week before Easter is preached about Palm Sunday that when Jesus came in and, and they laid down palm branches and they cried out, it's recorded in John 12, 13, that Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now those people declared Jesus was the King of Israel. But for all of them, that wasn't a declaration of faith. For many of them, that was just a declaration of their desire, what they wanted. They wanted a king who would come and deliver them from Rome. And what they were declaring was their desire. When we look about look at what Jesus said about faith, well, faith is much, much more than just a desire or a wish. But it's a complete trust. It's an assurance in God and Christ that changes the way we live. Look at what Jesus taught us found in Matthew 6. Let's look at verses 20, 25, 34. No one can serve two masters. Excuse me. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they need to toil or spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of them. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown to the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. If I read that right, Jesus is saying your faith is supposed to affect how you live. It's supposed to affect your daily life. Your faith is to be in God, who He is, what He's given in Christ, who He is, what He is bringing, brought to us, and what He's bringing to us, and the fact that we belong to Him, and they're going to take care of us. It's an essential for the kingdom. Now we could go on and on and look at Jesus continued to teach about faith, many, many things, and faith was always part of Receiving the promises of God. Receiving the benefit. It all took faith. 
And this faith was not a wish, it was not just a desire. So faith is essential. When we look at Matt, excuse me, Mark chapter 12, it records time when Jesus was questioned by a scribe that was sincere. Let's stop and think about that. He was questioned by a scribe who was sincere. It wasn't one that was coming to him, tempting him, trying to trick him, trying to catch him in his words. But it was one who came to him that was sincere. I want us to take note of the discussion they have. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no one other than he, but he. And to love him with all your heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. His answer was linking this truth to the kingdom of God. Jesus said, Love is what fills the commandment. Love is what fills the commandment. And if we start to dig down on that, we could look to, to John 13, 34, where Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, love. We could look to James' declaration in James 2, where he said that loving your neighbor as yourself is the royal law. The royal law, that means it's the law of the kingdom. Have you ever pondered the reality of that, of, of that statement? Of, can you imagine living someplace where the law of the land is, love your neighbor as yourself? Can you imagine living in such a place? That, that that's that's the, the law. Not all these laws about controlling people and manipulating people and taking from people, but that the law of the land is love your neighbor as yourself. That's the law of the kingdom. We're supposed to start implementing it here. Remember when, when we look at what Paul taught, he said that you can do all these great things and it's going to become nothing if you don't have love. 1 Corinthians 13. And then he goes on and he declares what love isn't and what love is. He talks about some other things, but then he concludes it and he says this. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So he's saying that these are things that remain, these endure. Faith, hope, love. And the greatest is love. Love's the law of the kingdom. It's essential for us to learn it. It's the law of the kingdom. Now Paul spoke about hope, abiding, remain. You know, Jesus taught about hope. Remember he said things like this in Luke 12, 32, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Man, if that doesn't give you hope, what will? It's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom? And then do we... Remember what Jesus said? Remember on the, the night he was betrayed and, and he knew that he was going to be crucified the next day? He knew what his followers were going to be experiencing. You know, just the overwhelming confusion, grief, and, and on and on. John 14, the first three verses. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's giving them hope. He's giving them hope. Comfort. Do you know that the next day when he was on that cross, have we considered that there was a guy hanging right next to him who was dying too? Jesus gave him hope. Luke 23, 42 and 43. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me. There. He gave that guy hope. Jesus came to make the kingdom of heaven available to us. Jesus came to make it available to us. And we're going to remember what it cost for that kingdom to be made available to us, for us to be a part of it as we take communion in just a moment. And, and while we do, while we're holding in our hand those tangible reminders of Jesus shed blood, his broken body, what it cost him to provide this for us. I want us to ponder these questions. First one is, do we perceive our relationship with Jesus as a treasure above all others? Do we perceive our relationship with him greater than anything this world has to offer? When it comes to faith, does our, our faith really affect the direction our life takes? Does our faith direct that? Remember, the faith of the disciples, they left their nets. They walked away from their jobs. By faith, they followed Jesus because they believed who He was. Does our, our love determine our responses in daily life? Does love determine our responses? Or maybe how we feel? And I don't ask for a show of hands because money would be right up there with everybody else's. But I fail at that. But remember, this is the law of the kingdom. To love our neighbor as ourself. And does our hope in Christ's coming kingdom really bring us a peace, a lasting peace that this world cannot take away? Does our hope bring that to us? Jesus brought that kind of hope. 